Good morning, class. We're talking about attitude dynamics today. So everything pins on rigid body dynamics. To start, we have to define a very key parameter to attitude dynamics. There's something called moment of inertia that all rigid bodies have. Moment of inertia is analogous to what mass would be for linear motion. Momenta, uh, moment of inertia is relevant for rotational motion or angular motion. So here um, I have a table of the different geometries that rigid bodies can have and their associated moments of inertia. To give you some intuition of what moment of inertia really means, it's a distribution of mass around some point. Most of the time we're going to be considering about the center of mass, which is also the center of rotation. So here you'll see in this picture, there are two rigid bodies. The center of mass is depicted by this um, circle with a checkered pattern where one body has a center of mass, the other body has a center of mass, and together their center of mass is somewhere linearly interpolated between their displacement vector. So this down here is demonstrating something called the parallel axis theorem, which is how you find the moment of inertia of say a dual spin spacecraft where you have two disjoint um, two disjoint bodies. This could also be relevant for a spacecraft with deployed solar panels. But for the most part, you're just going to be concerned with a rigid body that is totally onto itself. It's just like a rectangular parallel of pipe bed. Nailed it. So this cube set that we're talking about, it looks a lot like this, where there are three edge lengths. Um, because our edge lengths are all equal, by definition, the A, B, and L lengths are all going to be the same. Um, and all of your moments of inertia in, say, the three directions are going to be very, very similar. You can get a you know, rough estimate of your moments of inertia by inputting mass and the different edge lengths. But a more exact way of getting moment of inertia is to extract it from your, your computer-aided design, your CAD. One second. Yeah, so there are a bunch of bodies out there. Um, Sputnik was a sphere and it had this moment of inertia, but just focus on this rectangular parallel of pipe for your spacecraft. So next we'll move on to the concept of angular momentum. So we've talked about angular momentum when it comes to orbits, but rigid bodies also have their own angular momentum. So here you see a, a gyroscope that is what you would think is balancing on a point. Uh, the reason why it's balancing is because it has angular momentum that keeps it upright. There's a certain amount of stiffness associated with this motion that keeps it upright. A body in motion wants to stay in motion. And so this rotational motion is kept in place because of the energy, the motion of the rotor. So angular momentum, it can be thought of as analogous to linear momentum, but instead of say a particle with mass m moving at some velocity vector v, we're thinking about a rotor or some rigid body that has this inertia that is rotating with some angular velocity omega. So here you'll see the different variables lined up in their analogous form. So linear momentum, P equals mv. Angular momentum, L equals I omega. You'll also see angular momentum represented as H. Um, something I do want to say about this that I touched on briefly is that, you know, 
objects in motion want to stay in motion unless they're perturbed. So something fundamental that's assumed in there is the law of conservation when it comes to angular momentum. So this body, unless there is some friction, um, will stay spinning like this forever. Or if there's friction, it'll slow down. If there is someone poking at it, perturbing it, then it will change motion. But otherwise, it's going to stay spinning like that. And you can think of that for spacecraft as well. While it's in orbit, there are very minimal, um, there are very minimal external torques like atmospheric dra drag. Um, it's spinning in three degrees of freedom. It's in microgravity. So it will stay spinning in that motion unless you have some internal torque or significant external torque that you're imparting on the system. Another concept that I wanna talk about is kinetic energy. Now we think about kinetic energy typically as in the linear motion where T, which is kinetic energy is equal to one half V, uh, MV squared. But analogously, you can think of rotational kinetic energy as one half omega transposed dotted with the moment of inertia matrix dotted with the angular velocity vector again. And just like angular momentum, energy is conserved in a system. Yeah, um, I don't think there is any more insight to energy as there is with, okay, actually I can't talk about energy. So um, energy is conserved unless there are frictional forces, again, like angular momentum, anything that is externally perturbing or internally perturbing the system. Um, so you'll see later that some internal torques could include damping, which dissipates energy in the form of um, fluid vis viscosity and heat. But otherwise, if you just have a rigid body that's rotating with no kind of disturbances, it's going to conserve its energy. So how do bodies move? Um, how do you precisely predict how these systems propagate through time? So the equations of motion that dictate exactly how a body will rotate through time is given by Euler's equations. They're called Euler's rigid body equations. And so although I have a lot of equations here, I will conceptually talk about what the terms mean. So Euler's equations, they are a combination of the body's natural um, passive dynamics. So a system that doesn't have any perturbations, but then we add in an external disturbance, a torque. So under the influence of torque, how does the body react to it. We have here um, these little numbers on the top. What matters here is that the superscripts keep track of the frame that you're in. N stands for inertial. An inertial frame means it's a static frame. A Imagine just like drawing a box around the system. So that box is not moving. It's not accelerating. That's an inertial frame. Another superscript that you'll see is B. B stands for the body frame, where you're tracking with the body. So you'll put a box around your spacecraft, but the box edges will move with the edges and orientation of the spacecraft. Now that's important for later on when there are actuators within the spacecraft that move in the body frame. So it's strategic to use and keep track of the inertial frame and the body frame. All right, so let's break this down. A torque is going to cause a change, a derivative in angular momentum. And from a previous slide, 
we saw that angular momentum is defined as this first term. Um, moment of inertia dotted with angular velocity. You'll see that this derivative term, by taking the chain rule, you get um, moment of inertia times derivative of angular momentum, derivative of moment of inertia times angular, sorry, I misspoke, angular velocity. Now we can typically cancel out the moment of inertia change because the spacecraft it, within itself is not moving its mass around. It's a rigid body, so we can get rid of this um, change in angular momentum and just focus on this, this term, moment of inertia dotted with the change in angular velocity in the inertial frame. There's something called the transport theorem that converts this variable from inertia frame into the body frame. And the reason why this is useful is because our inertial measurement units, our gyroscopes, which are sensors in the spacecraft, measure angular velocity in the body frame. It's moving in the body frame, so it'll be able to give us angular velocity in the body frame, which is this value right here. So if we look at our equation of motion here, the amount of torque is proportional to the change in angular momentum plus some, you can call it um, something analogous to the Coriolis effect. Um, so there's this cross term. Now the, this is kind of hard to intuitively understand sometimes to like physically see. So I wanted to show you how that manifests in physics. So here is a gymnast. A gymnast can apply torque to the, uh, at their feet by, you know, adding some twist to their body and also jumping with some kind of torque uh, initially. If we break this equation down, so this, here's the final equation of motion. You have your uh, moment of inertia of your body, so the gymnast, and you have some rotational acceleration. You have the angular velocity of the gymnast crossed with its angular momentum. What you can see here, let's just follow, that uh, the torque in the twist direction is going to depend on the moment of inertia. So the amount of mass distribution around this axis times the rotational acceleration along that same axis. But then that Coriolis effect, that off axis effect is going to depend on the moment of inertia in the other directions and the rotational velocities in the other directions. So that's where that kind of like off kilter skewed motion kind of comes in. So that manifests in even if you are rotating in some direction, if you have moments of inertia that are in the other directions and your motion is perturbed, then you can get this unstable kind of behavior. So you see it was rotating about some major axis, but once it was perturbed, it was knocked off that stable axis and then it went to another axis. Um, this is called the intermediate something effect that I'll get to later. But this is a really cool phenomenon that we've seen on, on the International Space Station where you twist a handle and you see this unstable spinning. But yeah, that's, I guess, conceptually, that's some equations of motion propagating through time for this particular body that has this special moment of inertia. I know I talked about a lot of math, but I hope that we've broken down what individual variables mean and how they contribute to the physical phenomena of rotating bodies. Okay, so we were talking about rotation and equilibrium. Equilibrium are um, 
if there are no external or internal torques acting on the rigid body, then the spacecraft would settle into these angular momentum equilibria. So for this case, a body in motion that is around the minimum axis, the minimum axis being there's the least amount of mass distributed about that axis, will just stay in motion like that. Uh, you can think of this motion as what a pencil would do if you twisted it about its long axis or what a rocket would do. Um, you can also think of here's another axis where a lot of mass is distributed along this axis. In a hockey puck shape, a stable equilibrium configuration for rotation is going to be about this axis. You can think of this like frisbees. But there is an axis, so we've talked about two, there is an intermediate axis that isn't the smallest amount of mass distribution or the largest amount of mass distribution, but an intermediate axis. So that's the phenomenon of the intermediate axis theorem. Cool, isn't that neat? <laughs> Oh my gosh. Uh, okay, so now I wanted to show you a MATLAB demo. I'm going to take it from this page, which talks about the intermediate axis theorem. The intermediate axis theorem is really well demonstrated with a book tossed in the air where there are these three moment of inertias in the minimum, maximum, and intermediate axis that are well defined. Um, a tennis racket also is a good demonstrator. So you see it's going about its maximum axis. Sorry, it was going about its intermediate axis and then it was perturbed and rotated. So the equations of motion are here. I'm not going to go over them. I just wanted you to be aware of like maybe the non-intuitiveness of rotational dynamics. Uh, so we will see this is first principal axis. Uh, it's rotating about this axis right here, which has a pretty small moment of inertia. And then this one is the hockey puck axis maximum moment of inertia. And then this is the intermediate axis where you see there is, if you track that blue dot, it spins about a different axis. Okay, now I'm gonna show you the screen. I'm gonna see my face, lovely. Um, Okay, so in implementation, this is the way I've done it before. You can do it, um, I'm in MATLAB right now, but you can also do it in Python in whatever coding language. But essentially to create a simulation of the equations of motion, you have to write uh, simulation scripts. So here I've downloaded the code that Alyssa, Novelia, and Daniel Kawano wrote for this blog post that I just showed you. Um, so you need to input and know the different edge lengths, the mass, the gravity, um, and you have to set different initial conditions. So for this case, um, the initial conditions for the angular velocity are what I'm going to toggle, where the angular velocity about the first axis is really big and then small for the others. And then you can propagate or integrate the equations of motion where down below you have to actually code what your equations of motion are. Now you don't have to do this. I'm just demonstrating it to give you a feel for what it's like to be an ADCS engineer. This is a very simple demo. Um, in reality, you'll probably have to incorporate a lot more um, higher order effects and external torque space environment things, but let's just, I'll just show you. So running the simulation and it's gonna come up with an animation that we saw on that blog post.
So yeah, this is about the minimum access. Um, I think the first lecture I was talking about the responsibilities of an ADCS engineer, and this is one of them. So you're living it right now. Okay. That is irritatingly slow. So let's go back to lecture. Cool, cool, cool. All right, so we had talked about the simulation, the equations of motion without external or internal to torques. Now let's address what those external torques could be. We had talked about in the space environment lecture before, but let's just review. The reason why we care about this is because in the Euler equations, we saw that this is how the natural dynamics propagate. That's how they're governed. Um, but they are dependent. They have to be equivalent to the external torque that's applied to the system. So what are these external torques? They could be magnetic torque in the way of um, controlling magnetic torque coils or rods, or they could be external torques from um, the magnetic field in the space environment interacting with magnetic fields of boards. So it could be an external disturbance, not something that you particularly want to control. You can have gravity gradient torques, um, and you'll see that manifested in gravity booms. You can have aerodynamic torques that affect entry, descent, and landing technology, aero capture technology, or drag sails. Um, and then you can also have solar radiation, which affects your solar sail motion. And just as a reminder, these different space environment external torques affect the spacecraft at different, well, they scale differently at different regions. So in LEO, this is about the regime that we care about. And here is just another depiction of that, except on a log scale. Okay, let's talk a little bit of math, a little intuition as to what the torque equations look like. So for magnetic fields, the torque that's applied on the spacecraft is proportional to the spacecraft dipole. So the amount of magnetic fields that the spacecraft is generating crossed with the local magnetic field strength where the spacecraft is. Um, so the gray lines here represent the mag magnetic field and the red line represents the spacecraft's orbit. Now you'll see here that the spacecraft is rotating along its orbit. So if we imagine that the spacecraft is perfectly reactive and it perfectly aligns with the magnetic field uh, locally, then this is the kind of orientation that we would see in its orbit. Um, a magnetic torquer, so we'll talk about actuators tomorrow, but the magnetic torquer can manipulate the magnetic dipole, the direction of the ma magnetic dipole within the spacecraft. So it's not constrained to this kind of orientation throughout the orbit. You can actually make it so, um, yeah, that these magnetic torquers can make it so that these arrows are aligned with the magnetic field, but the spacecraft is always pointing at the Earth which would be nadir pointing and something that I think you all would care about. Okay, gravity gradients. Um, the way that this works is there are two masses that are disparately located and they're separated by this boom or this tether. And given the difference in mass, one will experience a greater force towards the Earth and create a net torque on the spacecraft that can give you a desired alignment like so. 
Um, you know that the gravity gradient is going to go radially inward towards the Earth. So this is really advantageous when you want to align the two masses in a vector radially towards the Earth. Um, the gravity gradient, the torque from gravity gradient is given by this equation where uh, you should recognize some things like the gravitational constant for Earth, if you were to orbit around Earth, uh, the location, so R, radius away from Earth. Um, and then also it depends on the spacecraft moment of inertias around certain axes. So if you wanna use this technology, these are things that you have to consider. For aerodynamic drag, you'll notice um, this equation is very familiar. The drag force is dependent on the atmospheric density, the velocity, drag coefficient, and impacted area. Now let's say that your spacecraft deploys its solar sail within orbit, um, but the velocity vector is like so, and your solar sail is kind of skewed. The amount of force that is on the sail in total is going to steady state the sail to be exactly perpendicular to the velocity vector. So there is a certain amount of torque that is integrated across the surface area of the sail due to the amount of force at every point along the sail across the, the area. Okay, and then while we're talking about sails, um, solar radiation, you can think of that as another way of imparting momentum to a large surface area, but instead of atmospheric particles, we're looking at solar radiation particles. So analogously, there is a force equation where we relate the area of the sail with, instead of coefficient of drag and density of the atmosphere, we're thinking um, solar constant, speed of light, surface reflectance, and incidence angle to the sun. So this will also have a kind of steady stating effect for the sail where it'll want to get driven towards um, for the surface area to be perpendicular or incident to the solar radiation particles. Okay, so those were all external torques. Um, torques can also come from within the spacecraft body. Within the spacecraft body, torques can come from dampers to mitigate unwanted vibrational rotation, gyrostats, or momentum control, and thrusters. These torques are typically used to control spacecraft motion. So this section will lay out the dynamic contribution of these internal torque sources. Something that I've said over and over again is that for spacecraft, you can use what's out there or you can bring stuff that you want with you. So this is the stuff that we bring with us. We can bring these dampers. Um, so the point of these dampers is if you have unwanted angular velocity in your system, like spacecraft tip off, right when you're deployed, you may have some imparted angular velocity to your spacecraft, but you actually don't want to be rotating. For example, you want to focus on a point, um, and if you're rotating, it'll blur an image. So instead, you want to damp that rotation out. Now the way to do it is to, for example, have some wheel inside that has a viscous, sorry, a wheel or a sphere that has a viscous fluid. Um, that absorbs momentum into heat through friction. The way that looks is um, the torque from the damper is proportional to some coefficient of damping. And the difference in velocity, angular velocity between the damper and the spacecraft body. So a faster uh, spacecraft body with a static or still um, 
damper is going to create more torque. Um, but if the difference is smaller, then less torque. Okay. So that was one passive way of controlling the spacecraft's dynamics. Now let's look at more active components. So this is probably going to be the most common form of control that's active. Um, a momentum control system is a system of rigid bodies whose relative motion does not change the total system with moment of inertia. Think of a box. So here we've got a hexagonal box with spinning rotors inside these casings. They can come in the form of reaction wheels or control moment gyroscopes. But this rotor, essentially the moment of inertia of the spacecraft does not change, um, but the rotor itself can impart angular momentum to the system. So here you'll see this equation that we love so much for ADCS, angular momentum is equal to the um, moment of inertia times angular velocity, but now we've got an additional term from the rotors. Uh, the rotor momentum term looks very much the same as, it looks similar to this, where it's the individual angular velocity of the rotors times the in individual rotor moments of inertia. But um, if you expand this equation, if you take the derivative of it, you can find the equation of motion that depends on, you'll see, um, it depends on the rotor torque, individual rotor torque, and the rotor momentum. I'm not going to talk about the exact form of this equation. Just know that the momentum control is dictated by rotor torque and rotor momentum. So how fast you spin your wheels and how quickly you decide to spin up your wheels or break your wheels. Another form of momentum control that uses consumables. So the previous method that was just using electricity to convert into angular rotational energy. Thrusters have to bring consumable propellants with them. The amount of torque that is imparted on the system is proportional to R cross F, where R is the position vector from the center of the spacecraft, center of mass. So in this case, R would be from, let's say, around here to here. So that would be R. Um, and then F, which is the thruster force vector. And it looks like this thruster is pointed that direction. So it'd be the amount of thrust in magnitude in that vector direction. Okay. So now let's talk about configurations. Um, based off the previously discussed torques and momentum control systems, we can start to relate configurations of momentum control, sometimes coupled with unique spacecraft bus geometry. These configurations can range from single axis spin to three axis and active to passive control. So you've got a whole different um, amount of options. It's just about what is the unique need of your mission? What can you get by with? So we talked about gravity gra gradient as an external torque. You can use gravity gradients as a stabilizer. So you'll see here um, a gravity gradient stabilization configuration. Um, this is PicoSat, and it shows a six meter long deployable boom with a small mass on the end. So that's that um, one of the masses, one of the disparate masses, and then here is the spacecraft. Now, a characteristic of the gravity gradient is that there are only control of two axes, pitch and roll. So you can control this angular, so um, about this vertical axis, you can control that rotation and you can control in and out of the page, the swaying in and out of the page. 
What you cannot control is rotation about the vertical axis. So it could spin like this. Um, gravity gradient stabilization, it has limited accuracy. So it depends on the spacecraft's moment of inertia. And you can expect accuracy to within about 10 degrees. It depends on the environment you're in. So in low, low Earth orbit, you feel the most gravity because the power, uh, power law with respect to distance. So it's not very effective beyond LEO. Um, another thing is that gravity gradients take a bit of time on the scale of, now I don't wanna, okay, but it takes a long time. So maybe like weeks to um, get itself into this configuration if you're just, you know, letting this boom and mass out. So you're not going to be able to conduct your primary operations until it's in this stable configuration. Now, another kind of stabilization is magnetic damping. This is essentially adding things that are magnetized. So these little bars, these links, um, these bars, these bars are all contributing to the spacecraft's magnetic moment dipole. And as we saw before, the way that this dipole interacts with the magnetic field is the spacecraft wants to align with the magnetic field. So in this case, we would see something like a change in orientation across the orbit um, if these are permanent magnets. So permanent magnets don't change their magnetic dipole over time. Instead, you'll see in next lecture, you can have magnetic dipoles that do change over time by using electromagnets. Um, which are magnet torquers. But in this case, this is a passive system. It's just using um, permanent magnets that have a static magnetic configuration. You can use this for magnetic damping. So again, if you have tip off, um, you can use these permanent magnets to absorb some of the angular momentum. Another configuration is that you can have a spacecraft that is spin stabilized. A spinning spacecraft keeps its angular momentum vector fixed in inertial space. Now the way to do this is you have to have a rotor within your spacecraft. So a reaction wheel or a control moment gyroscope that has its own angular momentum. And remember the gyroscope that was spinning on a wooden block, it stays in that attitude because there's stiffness to that motion. So you can apply that to spacecraft and um, have this spacecraft, for example, have its angular momentum vector pointing in the same direction in an inertial frame. Now in this configuration, the angular momentum vector is aligned with the orbit's angular momentum vector. But in this case, the angular momentum vector of the spacecraft is pointing always towards the top right corner. And it may not be particularly useful if along this face, you're trying to observe the Earth's surface because this angular momentum vector is constant with respect to inertial frame. So by the time it reaches this part of the orbit, the face that you wanted to observe the Earth is pointing away from the Earth. Okay, dual spin spacecraft. Now this is also using conservation of angular momentum to your advantage. But instead of having a reaction wheel or a rotor, some kind of rotor within your spacecraft, you're using these two bodies. Um, one of them down here, uh, this outer section is the one that's spinning. So the rotor is in this case, the frame of the spacecraft. Um, yeah, so it, it is very much like the spin stabilized configuration, uh, just embodied in a different structural form. Um, it has been used in the 
geosynchronous communication spacecraft, such as the satellite bus systems. Another thing that you can do with the reaction control, uh, reaction wheels or any kind of spinning rotor is you can impart momentum bias to your spacecraft. So also the same concept used by spin stabilized spacecraft. Um, but instead of spinning the whole spacecraft, only a small wheel is spinning and the spacecraft is static. Um, I don't think there's too much that's new with this. So I'm gonna move on. I think what's very common and also more fun and interesting, sorry, I'm biased, is to have three axis control. So we were talking about single axis control for the previous spacecraft where there was only one rotor, for example. So this one, you're just spinning about one axis. This one, you're also just spinning about this axis. This spacecraft has one reaction wheel that's spinning about one axis as well. But three axis control is when you have at least three reaction wheels that cover three linearly independent directions. In this case, we have four reaction wheels that cover these three directions. So there's some redundancy there, but you can toggle the amount of angular momentum in each wheel to get you a, a spacecraft angular momentum in any particular direction. Um, so you can get creative, you can get precisely the motion that you want. And these systems are also very reactive. So once the angular momentum of a wheel gets spun up, you'll see that immediately happen in the spacecraft. Um, what I'll note is that because angular momentum is conserved, there's that moment of inertia of the spacecraft is larger um, than the moment of inertia of the wheel. So you're going to need to spin the wheel faster in the rotor to get a smaller angular velocity in the spacecraft. Um, but yeah, so I think that this is the most complex kind of control that you can have on a spacecraft, three axis control. There are ways to make this even more complex by using control moment gyroscopes, which are more complex versions of reaction wheels. Um, but a lot of spacecraft use three axis control because it gives you the most control over how to point your spacecraft. It gives you very reactive control, very fast response. Now let's talk about the different kinds of ADCS modes of operation that you need to think about for your mission to think about the control that you need to impart, impart on your spacecraft. So we kind of hinted at this earlier, but in sequential order, in chronological order, the kind of dynamics that you'll experience across your mission are something like um, from your launch vehicle, you'll separate and there will be some maybe tip off rate. And then you'll probably want to power up your spacecraft. Um, you don't know how long you've been sitting in your rocket, dissipating power from your batteries, but you want to point at the sun. Next, you'll probably want to point at the earth um, whether that's for observation or for transmitting communications. Um, and then these are things that we may not see, but we may, there are other spacecraft that may want to transfer orbit. So to do that, you would have to orient yourself to point your thruster in the direction that you actually want to change your velocity. Maybe you want to deploy some mechanisms. Um, maybe to do that, there are, you want to be spinning or you don't want to be spinning. Um, for example, if you're deploying solar panels that wanna push outward away from your center of rotation, you can take advantage of a spinning spacecraft that's offering centripetal force to you know, 
pull these wings outward. And then uh, this is something that we're going to see, normal operations. Now, what does that mean for your spacecraft? Do you just want to be spin stabilized? Do you want three degree of freedom reaction yield control? Um, other modes that involve some control maybe is station keeping. Um, maybe you want to think about stuff like event recovery and protective measures, like we would go into something called safe mode, which is shutting off a lot of your instruments and pointing at the sun um, so that you can charge your battery and the mission operators on ground can figure out what to do next. So let's look into what the dynamics for each mode may look like. Um, so let's say we've just deployed from our rocket or whatever vehicle is carrying us and we have some tip off angular velocity. What we would like to do is to detumble. So that's what this simulation is showing. There is some kind of control within the spacecraft that is trying to slow down the amount of angular velocity or the amount of angular momentum that was imparted on the system so that eventually you can do your primary mission operations. Now, detumbling can also be called momentum dumping, where you have some larger angular momentum. You can use your magnet torpers or whatever to shed that angular momentum away from the spacecraft. That's why it's called momentum dumping. Uh, there are other modes, such as payload pointing. I'll just show you here. And Hubble's pointing control system is redundant throughout the entire system. It needs so payload pointing to point. can be towards outer space. So you'll see there, that was a control moment gyroscope, I believe. And uh, Hubble also has magnet workers on board, but essentially, the whole system is pointing outward, away from Earth, towards interesting astronomical observations. You'd also have payload pointing that is towards the Earth. Uh, this particular configuration, the pointing needed to be with respect to Earth's surface at some angle away from exactly later. And you could also have modes like sun pointing and radio pointing. And what that looks like is there is a small amount of slew that is associated with sun pointing and radio pointing. Because ground stations move with the rotation of the Earth um, and your spacecraft is moving with the rotation of its orbit. So unless they're exactly matched up, you're going to have to slew to track that ground station. Um, just for some numbers, if you are sun pointing, then the average slew, the amount of pointing motion that you have to impart to the spacecraft is about one degree per day. Whereas if you're tracking a ground station, um, high gain antennas that really care about pointing are going to have to slew at a rate of approximately 15 degrees per hour. Okay. And I answered all the questions. So 